challenging reconstruction in adults and children and developing innovative in plants and instruments are his key fortes. He is in the editorial board of Sarcoma, the official publication of CTOS, that is Connective Tissue Oncology Society, and is reviewer for JBJS, CORP, and IJO. Sir has developed a world-class tumor prosthesis indigenously, which is currently on clinical trial. He has helped create and nurture the biotechnology incubation center that is BETIC at IIT Mumbai. So over to you, sir, and thank you for sharing your experience with us today. Hi, friends. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in a meeting focused on fractures, but talking about something different. It's going to be pathological fractures, a topic which has often been ignored. And it requires to be uh, looked at because the way we would manage a pathological fracture is, is quite different from the way we would man manage a regular fracture, especially with all the new knowledge that has come in with the advancement of this science. So to, to put our points across and to emphasize that uh, managing pathological fractures is actually a multidisciplinary management where we require input from different kinds of uh, specialities. We've got a big team here assembled. It's like a tumor board. We've got uh, radiologists, pathologists, uh, radiotherapists, medical oncologists, and orthopedic oncologists. And through each case, we will try to show you what input uh, goes into uh, what the management of that particular case so that optimum outcomes are achieved. We are going to begin with uh, Dr. Jaffe going to tell us about what not to do or how not to make mistakes when we are trying to fix pathological fractures. So over to you, Dr. Jaffe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to everybody uh, today. Good evening. And uh, I am excited to uh, talk to everybody tonight about a uh, thank you, this opportunity to uh, discuss pathologic fractures. As Dr. Manish said, this is a, this is a, a specific challenge that uh, we all face. And uh, these fractures uh, are not gonna heal predictably and trying to identify the challenges ahead of time um, will help us achieve a better outcome. So avoiding failures of fixation and pathologic fractures requires some workup in the beginning and requires some planning and executing that plan. So thanks again for having me and good evening. Uh, as a fact of disclosures, I have no financial interests uh, related to this topic. I don't receive any money for the implants that I'm about to show. Uh, I do have some educational uh, interests, and uh, it is a passion of mine to be involved with the treatment of these pathologic fractures um, as I am involved in our trauma program in my hospital, but also in the tumor board. So, um, and, and thanks to the OTA uh, for co-coordinating uh, this event. So, in terms of pathologic fractures, uh, I think that one of the most common types of pathologic fractures is osteoporosis. And when it comes to fractures around the proximal femur, there's uh, a lot of evidence and data uh, that guide us into choosing the correct procedure to treat this patient. So when it comes to pathologic fractures related to osteoporosis, a lot of the decision-making comes in choosing the right implant for that pattern of fracture, and then applying that implant correctly. So if you choose the wrong implant for the pattern, or you apply the implant incorrectly, you may lead to early failures. When it comes to pathologic fractures related to cancer, I think that there's gonna be some additional workup prior uh, to the fixation that you're gonna have to pay attention to. So traumatic versus pathologic or low energy fractures have some clinical differences. Traumatic fractures will usually be high energy. They are associated with 
periosteal stripping. And the bone healing can usually be normal. There are other associated injuries that you have to consider when treating an eye, uh, a femur fracture in that patient. Uh, but then you have your lower energy or pathologic fractures where uh, the periosteum is usually intact. They tend to be an isolated injury. And if they are coagulopathic related to their underlying cancer, it's not quite uh, certain that, that can be corrected immediately. If the fracture is related to a metastatic carcinoma, that patient is gonna have a limited survival. So you wanna choose an option that provides that patient the ability to mobilize early um, because they don't have unlimited amount of time to heal and recover. Um, and that's very important to recognize early. So when you have high energy fractures, we're, physic we're typically using our clinical expertise and physical examination to assess a multiply injured patient. And there's guidelines that suggest uh, resuscitation and damage control can be used as a strategy with polytraumatic patients. And very often you can't get a good history from this patient. So most of your clinical decisions and the studies that you're ordering on this patient are based on the physical exam. In contrast, when you have a low energy trauma, you have the benefit of talking to the patient. And that's, pro that's the most important point that I want to show today is that your workup is based on your history. Sometimes we are lucky that we can get outside records. Very often, uh, they are not available. Uh, I think that getting medical records from other hospitals is a challenge, uh, and it is for me in my practice. Uh, but understanding what factors led to this fall, if there is any pain experienced prior to the fall, and also asking about constitutional symptoms weight loss, fever, coughing, um, bloody stools, any piece of information that can be used to guide your clinical decision-making and also order appropriate tests. Not every patient is gonna get the same tests. So understanding what led to this fracture, understanding what is your differential diagnosis based on your history is gonna be extremely important to guide your treatment because pathologic fractures have three components. Um, you have to make the correct diagnosis in order to set up the correct surgical plan. And very often you're gonna need some additional post-operative management for these pathologic fractures because usually when you're treating a, a standard fracture, after you fix the fracture, you, if the fracture just needs time to heal. Pathologic fractures will need an additional medical management after the fixation to ensure a good outcome. So your treatment objectives are to decrease pain, restore function and mobility, limit the amount of surgical procedures, as I spoke previously, that these patients has a limited lifespan. You wanna minimize the hospital time and then fracture healing, although it can happen in these pathologic fractures, we have to recognize that the healing is gonna be delayed or perhaps not possible. So understanding that point is crucial. And I wanna illustrate some of these points with a few cases. This is a 48 year old male. He was out mountain biking. Uh, we have a lot of mountains here in New Mexico and that's a very common sport. And he had no pain prior to getting on the bicycle, but once he was uh, launched into a tree, he broke his femur and presented to our hospital. And as you can tell, there is what seems to be a two-part fracture of the proximal femur. But if you look a little bit closer, there is a lesion there. And the lesion has sclerotic margins. This gentleman is over the age of 40. Uh, which is very young. So if you had any doubts, 48 
very active, healthy, no pain prior to this accident, but there is a lytic lesion in the proximal femur. And typically I'll tell my residents that whenever you see a lytic lesion in a patient over the age of 40, you have to rule out a metastatic carcinoma because metastatic disease, myeloma and lymphoma is the most common cause of a lytic lesion in this population. However, that should be confirmed with the biopsy. And I am extremely fortunate that I have a pathologist on call even on the weekends in my hospital. So uh, although I, I do believe that most uh, bone biopsies can be done safely with the needle, I'm not gonna send a patient with a displaced fracture to the interventional radiology suite and then go back to surgery a few hours later. So this patient had an open biopsy um, with plan for fixation based on the frozen section. So our pathologists can't give me all the information during the frozen section. They can't freeze bone, but they are able to give me a general idea of what the tissue represents. So although I may not be able to tell the difference between these two slides, the one on the right it is a metastatic carcinoma, and the one on the left represents fibrous dysplasia. And in this case, the patient had the image on the left. So um, although I would have proceeded with intramedullary nailing either way, I wanna make sure that the diagnosis from the tissue is accurate. And we do that by sending a biopsy, not sending reamings. So this is one of my first points is never ream a femur fracture through an unknown lesion. It's much, more, it's much better to give the pathologist good tissue if you expect an accurate diagnosis. So that is very, very important is even if you're the risk, the, uh, you're thinking that it's likely a metastatic carcinoma, it's very important not to ream or contaminate the femur until that is confirmed by a pathologist. So this is the example of the open biopsy. Uh, after the results were obtained, we did a close of open reduction and in intramedullary nailing, and the patient went on to complete healing without additional treatment because the tissue diagnosis was confirmed during the procedure. So your diagnosis is extremely important before you proceed to the other two components of treating pathologic fractures. So your diagnostic evaluation will always include a thorough clinical examination and history. You have to ask people specifically if they've had cancer because sometimes they'll forget if they had prostate cancer 10 years ago. Um, in the event of a displaced fracture, sometimes the patient has had, received pain medication. They may not be fully oriented. So reaching out to family members is extremely helpful in this situation. In terms of routine tests, you want to get laboratory values, uh, chemistries, and one thing that's very important is calcium. Some patients with multiple myeloma can have hypercalcemia and renal failure, and this is going to prevent uh, you from going to the operating room immediately. So recognizing that hydrating the patient will get them ready for surgery if you are planning to operate on a displaced femur fracture. You wanna get plain radiographs of the entire bone that is fractured. You won't, don't wanna miss a skip lesion. And then as you, as you know here, I don't include PET CTs or MRIs. I think for a displaced femur fracture, uh, I don't think that's a routine study that you should order. Your, your studies that you order should be based on your clinical decision-making. Because it's, in my experience, it's very hard to get an MRI on a patient that's in pain with a displaced femur fracture. And as long as I understand my differential diagnosis, I can make proper decisions and do a safe biopsy before putting any implants in the patient. And uh, to illustrate that point, this is a 58-year-old female that fell while carrying groceries. She was standing, she didn't fall. 
the pain made her fall and then she broke her femur. She was not uh, climbing any ladders or stairs. Uh, she was simply walking and the pain was so severe that made her fall. She had had six weeks of pain prior to this incident. And these are the x-rays that were taken in the hospital. There are some aggressive features that all of us should recognize in this x-ray. There is expansion of the metaphysis. There is a matrix within the lesion uh, and there's calcifications that are expanding the bone. So this, although this patient is over 40, there are rare sarcomas that can do this. And in this population, a primary bone lesion is most likely a chondrosarcoma. Unfortunately, that was not recognized at the time of the injury. And this patient had a biopsy, but it was sent and the patient was plated um, in this manner. I think that uh, the diagnosis was given to the patient a week later and never assume a lesion is metastatic until you've done your workup. I think that it's not all a common thing to have a pathologist on call. I think if, if you suspect a primary bone lesion, it is very reasonable to just take a tissue biopsy and do nothing further. If you have to refer the patient because uh, your clinical examination has alerted you of perhaps a more aggressive primary bone lesion, I think that that's a patient that you should decide if you should refer or not. So never assume the lesion is metastatic, even if the patient is over 40. Metastatic disease is very common uh, for pathologic fractures because carcinomas have a predilection for bones that contain hematopoietic marrow. Uh, it is very common in the spine and the, long, and the um, flat bones, the skull, the vertebra, and the shorter girls, but it can happen also in the hips and the humerus. If you see lytic lesions in the hands or the feet, typically it's a higher incidence of lung or renal carcinoma. The fractures in the upper extremity uh, you can work up uh, a bit better. The patient has less pain. You can control the pain in a sling or in a brace. So, so a displaced humerus fracture or a displaced radius fracture doesn't have the same clinical urgency as a displaced femur fracture. So you have a little bit more flexibility for doing a, a workup. And this is an example of a patient who's 43. He's also over the age of 40. He has a lytic lesion in the right proximal humerus. The surgeon decided to fix the humerus with an intramedullary nail. Uh, they did do a biopsy at that time, um, but didn't wait for confirmation of the tissue. And unfortunately for this patient, he was diagnosed with metastatic renal cell carcinoma. And those of us who's treated metastatic renal cell carcinoma understand that it's a very, a very aggressive type of carcinoma because it doesn't respond to radiation as favorably as the other types of metastatic carcinoma. Um, and in this situation, the patient uh, did not heal. There was no bone graft. There was no cement used to augment this fracture. Clinically, if you're doing surgery on a patient with metastatic renal cell carcinoma, but you don't know what it is, it is likely that you will encounter significant bleeding. These are very vascular metastases. So uh, in addition to having a pathologist, I'm very fortunate to have many radiologists who are experts in uh, interventional techniques. So embolizing some of these tumors can be very helpful in decreasing blood loss. So um, after about four months, there is no evidence of healing. Patient had completed the first cycles of chemotherapy, but still had severe pain. And in this setting, uh, I offered the patient a revision to a uh, custom endoprosthesis. So when you're thinking about patients that have metastatic 
carcinomas and pathologic fractures, you have to understand that they have a limited lifespan and they may not be healthy enough to undergo a secondary procedure. So choose the most durable construct for early function. And uh, this patient did survive many years, but could have been avoided a, a four month episode of shoulder pain. Um, but we don't always get all the information ahead of time. We also don't know how the patient is gonna respond to the treatments for their primary cancer. So we depend a lot on our pathology and our medical oncology colleagues to understand what additional treatments this patient is gonna undergo. Similar case, this patient has known breast, breast cancer as a displaced fracture of the right proximal femur. It's been recently diagnosed patient is currently on chemotherapy and uh, this fracture interrupted the chemotherapy. Uh, there was previous bone biopsies confirming a skeletal disease. So this patient did not have to have an uh, urgent bone biopsy, but did have uh, a open reduction in internal fixation of this femur fracture. With the radiation, with the chemotherapy, there is expected delayed or absent bone healing. And within 15 months, we already had failure of this implant. This patient, however, was still in a medical state that was healthy enough to have revision surgery and went on to have a endoprosthetic reconstruction of this with a cemented prosthesis. So we don't get a second chance very often, but sometimes we're lucky and we can offer the patient uh, a procedure that gets them up and walking. So there's lots of options once you understand the diagnosis and try to predict what additional treatments the patient is gonna have. Uh, there's many uh, technique uh, challenges. You can use a plate, you can use locking, or you can curette the lesion. When it comes to nailing, I think most of the time we're choosing an anti-grade nail. Uh, there are some situations where a retrograde nail can be used, but it, it typically leaves the femoral neck unprotected. And then when choosing an arthroplasty option, uh, sometimes you're choosing between a hemiarthroplasty or doing a total arthroplasty. Um, you can use some cementless fixation. My personal choice is to typically use cemented fixation when doing arthroplasty in pathologic fractures. This is an example where a case where I learned a lot from this patient. This patient is 54, has a displaced fracture of the right femoral neck. So there's some bone loss in the medial calcar. We did an open biopsy of this patient, which confirmed metastatic carcinoma. But sometimes the pathologist needs additional time to come up with the answer of what type of metastatic carcinoma it is. Uh, we had, we presumed that it was breast but we weren't sure. And then the final pathology a few days later revealed that it was metastatic lung. So the patient was referred to the medical oncologist after this operation. And while she was waiting for a wound to heal and start her chemotherapy cycles, she fell again. So this time we already knew what type of lung uh, metastatic carcinoma she had. Uh, she had non-small cell lung carcinoma, and uh, this fall uh, resulted in another surgery and another two-week delay of her chemotherapy. Uh, so now she has bilateral hip arthroplasties, one cemented, um, one is press fit. I think you can argue that, uh, that there's been some lysis of the trochanter that is very worrisome. And this patient is also referred immediately to radiation oncology to prevent further bone destruction while she's on chemotherapy. So external beam radiation is very important in the setting of metastatic carcinomas. Number one, because it relieves pain. It reduces the risk of narcotics. Um, it can slow down bone healing but again, our goal is not to necessarily heal the bone, but prevent the tumor from spreading and destroying more bone. So in cases of metastatic cancer, where you're not excising the entire tumor, which is primarily most metastatic lesions, 
uh, radiation is a very helpful adjuvant to treating these patients and decreasing complications. Um, radiation, as I mentioned, can also slow down bone healing. This is a patient that had a previous sarcoma, therefore had a high dose radiation to the entire thigh, suffered a pathologic fracture years ago, but two years later, it's not healed yet. Patient has severe pain, and unfortunately, it's very hard to bone graft or get a radiation-induced fracture to heal. So this patient was treated with an endoprosthetic reconstruction after a resection. And because this fracture is unlikely to heal, uh, this was the most viable option that was selected for this patient. This is a more technically challenged operation. This patient, uh, their initial cancer was treated over 10 years ago. So technically they have a very good life expectancy at this point. They've finished all their treatments and they have after effects of a high dose radiation to the proximal femur. And this is the operation technically uh, re repairing the abductors is one of the factors that allows for good function. And in this case, we did a soft tissue repair through the holes in the prosthesis and allowed for immediate weight bearing after the surgery. So in summary, these are challenging cases. The case on the left is an unrecognized chondrosarcoma that was treated with a retrograde nail. And this patient, unfortunately, uh, continued with their pain even during their systemic therapy. The patient on the right, uh, as you can tell, has a unreduced pathologic fracture. And uh, this is unlikely to heal. I think that we have to reduce displaced fractures in order to help our implants uh, take stress off them and minimize failure. So um, this patient was not able to weight bear because this fracture was very painful and um, could not uh, weight bear immediately. So, so those are the, the techniques and the tips that uh, I would emphasize and have everybody remember when treating pathologic fractures understand that getting the right diagnosis sets up the surgical plan and the post-operative management for these patients, which is the key to a good outcome. Uh, the rules of stabilization of these fractures is typically you wanna stabilize the entire bone in such a way that weight bearing is immediate. If you have bone loss or lytic lesions, you wanna use cement and not bone graft. And you want to find a radiation oncology friend that you can refer this patient to uh, to prevent the metastatic cancer from progressing. So one of the pitfalls that we talked about is assuming the lesion is metastatic. Failure to recognize the fracture is pathologic and putting less than adequate fixation in a fracture that is expected to have delayed bone healing, if not absent. So please take careful history and examination because that will help you identify most primary lesions. Pathologic fractures of the femoral neck usually require prosthetic replacement. A biopsy is needed when a primary lesion has not been identified. Um, the most common diagnosis of a lytic destructive lesion in a patient over 40 is bone metastases and external beam radiation is very helpful for local control and pain uh, reduction. Thank you very much. So I, I'm going to put a question to uh, the surgeons here, uh, Eduardo Prakash. Uh, how comfortable would you be operating without having any imaging like an MRI or a PET CT in a pathological fracture of the neck of femur? Would you want Dr. Eduardo to go first? Yeah, Dr. Eduardo. Okay. 
I, I never fix a pathologic fracture, neither proximal femur uh, in every bone without perfect image. I need to have a perfect image. Despite, probably I could fix it have multiple meds, but if a solitary oligo or oligometastasis less than five, I would like to have a proper imaging. Mainly MRI of the whole compartment. I don't want probably axial view. I, I said to the radiologist, I, I only need a coronal view, T1, to see if the, all the bone is perfect. But always image before. Prakash? I echo uh, Dr. Eduardo's thoughts. Uh, I certainly want um, an FDG, a PET CT, or some appropriate staging, especially if the clinical exam has not thrown out a hint towards the likely primary. Uh, most importantly, not only would it help me decide the site of my biopsy, uh, I would want to be sure that I'm not missing any distal met to the obvious pathologic fracture, that I'm not missing any uh, vertebral or an epidural spinal cord compression, uh, which is coexisting. Um, and it would help me plan my management best. So yes, I would want further imaging and a systemic staging in virtually every case. Over. Now, I have a question for Bharat. Bharat, uh, as Dr. Chaffee did, I mean, it's very understandable that you don't want to put the patient through pain and waiting when you have a displaced femoral fracture. But how confident are you of making a good diagnosis on frozen section in such a case? Yeah, so frozen section, we generally not recommend for primary diagnosis. But certainly, if there's, you know, like uh, uh, Dr. Shafe mentioned about, you know, a lytic lesion where there's an index of suspicion for metastasis and we are, uh, you know, seeing a frank carcinoma, we can pick it up on frozen. So frozen uh, is good enough uh, to pick up a metastatic tumor and to be able to know actually whether it's a tumor in fact. Uh, but to categorize, for example, you know, maybe a chondroid tumor, that will be a difficult, that will be a challenge. So that has to be put in a radiological context. So accordingly, we can make certain decisions on frozen. Dr. Chaffe, one, the question to you is, what if uh, that particular lesion had turned out to be a carcinoma in the neck of femur and that was the solitary lesion? I mean, without any further imaging, would your plan of treatment would have changed had you uh, known this information beforehand? I think it's going to change what the, the patient's going to ultimately get as a, as a treatment uh, in addition to the fracture. But the, the femoral neck, if, if you have a, a workup that indicates a primary lesion elsewhere, um, and the patient either has a mass in the kidney or mass in the liver, then you have a working diagnosis. And just like the, uh, Dr. Barat just mentioned, it's very hard to do a diagnosis and avoid. You have to take all the clinical information and then use the frozen tissue to help uh, clarify that information. So, so there's not just one thing that you order all the time. I think that that patient... Uh, instead of fibrous dysplasia, that was metastatic cancer. I think I would have treated it the same way. I would have treated with uh, nail and compression. I think it's very hard to treat uh, acutely uh, before you know how they're going to respond to treatment with a, with a proximal femur replacement. So pathologic fractures can heal, but it's if the patient survives more than a year. So surviving after a pathologic fracture is a good thing. And uh, those are the patients that we actually see heal if they, if they survive and they respond to the ultimate treatment for their primary cancer. Yes, Dr. Khan. Uh, Dr. Chaffe brought out a point that about 35% of the pathological fractures do not need surgery. Is there a way or the patients can identify which doesn't need surgery? Um, i I not sure which slide that was, but um, I would say that uh, 
most pathologic fractures require some workup, uh, maybe not fixation, uh, but it's, it's an opportunity to, to diagnose with the patient with an unknown cancer. So um, I guess an upper extremity fracture in a patient with metastatic disease is not always operative because you're considering the medical condition of the patient. So it's not that you won't offer them surgery, but you have to understand the risks and the benefits. And, and honestly, we're terrible at predicting the future and predicting uh, survivorship. So um, trying to understand the goals of the patient is very important. And if the patient already has a diagnosis of cancer and is, is undergoing chemotherapy, I'm not going to interrupt that chemotherapy for, for a clavicle fracture or for a humerus fracture. I'm going to try to find other non-operative ways to manage that fracture until there's an opportunity that is safe. Thank you. I don't, I don't think we have any other questions from the audience and we can, we can reinforce uh, some of the things. So, so I think Dr. Chaffee, uh, 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 you did an excellent job in just outlining how we must approach a, a pathological fracture. I think uh, I can't highlight or I can't uh, trumpet more than saying that it needs to be worked up. I don't think you can go into a pathological fracture without a surgical plan or without having some idea of what could the possible pathology be. Because the whole approach would change considering whether this particular fracture is likely to heal or not likely to heal, whether they're going to require any future radiation, chemotherapy, what's going to be the lifespan. So I think these are factors which are going to be extremely important and helpful for the surgeon to decide what is going to be done for the patient. And I think you brought that out very clearly that you may never get a second chance if, if your first fixation fails. It's quite rare that a patient is going to be fit for another operation when the disease is more advanced and the patient is, is, has a poorer performance score than what it was at first presentation. So uh, is there anybody else who wants to ask a question? Otherwise, we will go on to the next section. So for the radiologist, I have one last question. Now, if you, if you had this patient of a neck femur, where I'm not sure whether this is a, a pathological fracture from a tumor or is from osteoporosis, how can you help the orthopedic surgeon sort it out? Santosh, Bhavin, Chinmay, Anil. I can go first. I mean, you know, obviously we would review the radiograph uh, together and just you know, be very clear that we still have a problem. Sometimes just talking it out, we could figure out that, you know, perhaps there is a pathologic fracture and not just osteoporosis. But if you're still confused, then I would get an MRI done. I think that really helps in picking up the, um, you know, differentiating the marrow edema of the fracture from an underlying tumor. And then once you're sure there's a tumor, then, you know, next steps in terms of what you want to do to figure out what it is. How difficult it is to get an MRI done or a PET CT done for a person with a displaced femoral fracture in pain? So it is. I mean, we've had trouble. Um, we would sometimes use sedation for that. Um, we've also, on occasion, had CT scans done very quickly because you can do them very, very fast, uh, depending on what is available or not. So honestly, if you're in a hospital, for example, that doesn't have an MR or you're in a small nursing home and you have a CT, but you don't have an MR, then you use what you have and you just do that and hope to get an answer. But if you're in a place where you have all modalities and all things being equal, MR is preferable over CT, but you use what is best uh, doable. So one last question to the entire panel. Is there any justification in fixing a pathological fracture without doing a biopsy?
are there any any indications where you will just go and fix a pathological fracture and not do a biopsy i think i think that can be done if there is a recent diagnosis of cancer and the patient has documented previous bone metastases so if the patient has had mul has known breast carcinoma and has lesions in the spine that have recently been biopsied and you're, obser you're observing a femur lesion and that breaks, I think, that, uh, I think that's a safe assumption that that is recently related. I think that we have to avoid assuming in cases where the cancer has been treated remotely because uh, I have treated patients with a secondary primary years after their treatment. I've treated patients with myeloma that therefore go on to have lung carcinoma 15 years later. So, so if it's a recent diagnosis and there's been a bone biopsy already done, I think that situation, I would feel comfortable fixing the fracture. Yeah, I, I, I think that's a very important point because very often somebody who's come to us with a pathological fracture as the first presentation without any prior history of cancer. I think in, in those cases, I think the very important message is that you will not do any fixation unless you have a biopsy, whether you choose to do it by frozen section, when you have from imaging a, a kind of a diagnosis which is there, or whether you want to do it pre-op and then go in and, and plan your surgery. It's very important to have a diagnosis when there has been no previous history of any tumor or cancer. But also, it's very important that is the issue that we have to recall that we are working in a multidisciplinary teams. If the, the day after of this, we have some doubts, we have a, a meeting like we are now, I said, so uh, we talk with the medical oncologist, this is your patient, what do you think? And, and we put all together and take the decision all together. We don't have to have hurry. If we have hurry, we are going directly to the mistakes. So be careful, next day, everybody, uh, talking about in a multidisciplinary team and take the decision. It's my point of view. Okay, so so let's let's move on to our cases now. Yes. Looking forward. So this is our first patient. This is an 11-year-old boy. Uh, he's, he's had a very uh, trivial fall in school. I mean, uh, he's, he says he's just uh, twisted his uh, arm. And, and then the x-rays were done. He had swelling. He's, he's had this fracture through a lytic lesion. So again, I'm, I'm first going to open it to the uh, radiologists. Uh, is this very obvious? in 11 year old with a well-defined lytic lesion that this is something benign and can be treated conservatively or does it require additional workup when you look at these x-rays? Yeah, I think it does require additional workup. Yes. And MRI, so, maybe to begin with. I, I, I can see a fallen fragment, you know. So once in a while, when you see something very obvious, um, I mean, yes, today you would do an MR, but I'm just saying if, if you know for sure that, you know, this is a simple bone cyst and you see a fallen fragment, do you really need an MR? Just for argument's sake. I know the MR will get done anyway, but do we really need one? No, Bhavind, I'm asking you this question because most often it does not get done. There is an assumption that this is a, a simple bone cyst. And if the patient is lucky, he's treated conservatively. If the patient is unlucky, he's operated. And, and a fixation is done. So yeah, I, think, uh, I think if somebody does not have access to high quality expertise and a multidisciplinary team that deals with bone tumors on a day-to-day -day basis, then an MRI is a must. Well, uh, Bhavin, the question, the problem which most surgeons have discussed with me is that uh, even if they get an MRI done in the presence of a fracture, 
is very difficult to interpret it. Once it, it it's a it's a very easy MRI to diagnose if the patient has not fractured and you're seeing a simple bone cyst. But once the patient has fractured, then then how complex is it or how how difficult it is for you to be certain that this is a simple bone cyst? And I'm going to share that pic these pictures with you. So, uh, I mean, you can see that it's a cyst. You can see that there is no enhancement um, except for the rim. And I think the axial images are post contrast, which really helps. A lot of people don't do contrast imaging. And I think for every focal bone lesion, you must give contrast. Um, so in this situation, when you're seeing the cyst both superiorly and inferiorly, and then in the middle, you see a lot of muck, which is because of the fracture. Uh, you're quite sure what you're dealing with here. So do I need a biopsy? So this is my question to the entire panel now. Uh, would you biopsy this patient or are you very certain that this is a simple bone cyst? Because biopsying the cystic lesion is always difficult. I think uh, all pathologists and all surgeons will tell you that we don't get any material. And it's very difficult to interpret uh, the material that that you do manage to get even with a needle biopsy. So um, that's that's a great point. Uh, I would say that um, back to your question about the MRI. Uh, I I like to approach these cases as, as if they were you know real time scenario or if they were my child. And uh, I would say that if the patient had a clinical history that didn't suggest pain prior to the fall and is otherwise feeling good, I, I don't think this child requires a, an admission or an urgent MRI. I think if this is my child, if they're comfortable in a brace and a sling, I, I, I want them you know, to go home and, and get the MRI scheduled uh, a few days later. I think that if the clinical history and the imaging are more suggestive of a benign process, I think the MRI can be scheduled uh, within a week, uh, but not necessarily admitting the child and, and putting them in the hospital, certain with, certainly with all these considerations and COVID. So, so uh, you have to kind of treat patients with the resources that you have. But once you have the MRI, and, uh, and you have a radiologist that's very, very confident that it's a cyst, um, I think doing a needle biopsy in this lesion is gonna, is gonna provide limited tissue for the pathologist. Usually there's just blood. Uh, it's hard to get the lining of the cyst. Uh, so so I'm, I'm gonna do an open biopsy and then depending on uh, the frozen uh, I would I would say if I want to stop and have the, the pathologist uh, do all their uh, comprehensive workup, or if if it's fairly uh, obvious it's a cyst, uh, and I've already decided that it's going to need require a curatage, then if my pathologist and my radiologist agree with me, I think that uh, I I would offer uh, some type of surgical stabilization. Uh, but I treat a lot of cysts the first time conservatively, and if they refracture, um, when I'm when I'm absolutely sure they're a cyst, uh, I'll treat them upon refracture. Eduardo, would you would you would you think of surgery for this patient, or after the MRI, uh, you think that you have a good diagnosis and you can treat this conservatively? <laughs> That's a good point, a very difficult question. Could be, I will go, if, I, if the MRI is doing with a, after one week, the, the MRI is looking for the specialized radiologist and he said, or she said, this is a UVC. Probably, probably I will go to the orthopedic treatment. I think I will go to orthopedic treatment because it's huge, I don't know, huge it, and to make a, a, too much bone graft, I, go, I will want to have the first option to see if this is going to heal. And then I will see if when it's healing, I will, I, 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 I will think about the, the, the definite treatment if needed. 
So in summary, I will go to the orthopedic, I will go to the orthopedic treatment and, and wait until heal the, the, the UVC. So this we treated conservatively because uh, yeah. in our experience, almost all uh, UVCs in the upper limb uh, will go on to an uneventful healing and almost 60 to 70% of the time, the fracture will actually initiate healing in the cyst itself also. And if, thus, if some part of the cyst does remain or doesn't heal or, or increase, then we generally treat it with an injection. I mean, we just traumatize the cyst wall and then uh, uh, probably whether we uh, give steroid or not uh, doesn't seem to matter in our experience. So this, this has gone to uneventful healing and that's the final follow-up. I'm going to go to the next case, uh, which is again a child, a little younger child, and he's seven year old. And again, the history is that he was just playing while throwing a ball, uh, uh, he felt something snap and the extras were taken here. Now, again, the question for the radiologist is, uh, how do we approach it? Do we treat it the same as what we did in the previous case? Just uh, treat it in a cast and uh, wait for it to heal or do we need more imaging? I think here we should do MRI in this case. I mean, what's different uh, in this compared to what you saw previously? So there we uh, clearly saw a uh, mildly expansive elytic lesion. You know, it did look like a cyst, unicameral bone cyst with a uh, fallen fragment. Whereas here, if you see, uh, there is some lucency in the distal fragment at the fracture side. And uh, we need to be sure whether, you know, what, kind of lesion and MRI will really help to see the marrow and if there is any pathology. Now, uh, Bhavin, do you have any opinion on uh, what could be the diagnosis here from just the x-rays? I mean, there's a sclerotic lesion, uh, which is very unusual. Um, is there know. a ground glassing? I mean, do you think there is yeah, some kind yeah. of ground glass yeah, appearance yeah. here? Yeah, so that's why it's a little sclerotic. And uh, which is very unusual in the diaphysis in this age group. And even to get a fibrosis lesion at this age is not common. So it would be nice to get more imaging done. Yeah, and, and there is a certain expansion of the bone as well. So it, it just tells you that this is something which has been there for some time. So the, the surgeon who saw him did get a CT scan done, as you can see here. And, and very clearly, there is a ground glassing in, in that region through which the fracture has happened. And that's the MRI. So if anybody wants to go in, otherwise, okay, if you go back, um, Manish, yeah, you know, on these T1 images, um, while I don't know what this is, I can quite say that it, it's probably benign because you see that, um, you know, the burrowing of the lesion into the fat and the fat density within the lesion itself, which is very unusual for any kind of a, an infiltrative malignant tumor. So if you take the ground glass and you take the fact that it's probably a benign lesion, then you are looking at some form of a fibrosis uh, uh, tumor, but I don't have a name for it at this stage. So how would you approach it, Prakash, uh, Eduardo? I definitely um, agree. No. After you, Dr. Eduardo, after you. No. I definitely go to biopsy percutaneous uh, biopsy, and very important to have a very expert pathologist. Because now you are talking about fibrous tissue that said the radiologist, and this man has a fracture, it could be difficult to define the pathologist, what kind of diagnosis is. But that is, the, we need an expert pathologist, but we need a needle biopsy. True, good. So, so, so Bharat, uh, now if, if, if the surgeon is going to send you a, a biopsy and it's very likely that this is going to be for frozen section because it's a child, you're going to take it under anesthesia, you don't want to do it twice, there's a fracture, there's pain. 
Now, what is what is your confidence level in giving a good diagnosis, at least whether it is benign or malignant, to the surgeon so that he can proceed with a plan? Go. Like For me? Ah, go. Bharat, continue, Bharat. So, like I mentioned, uh, you know, frozen section is not an indication for classification of primary bone tumors. There's this considerable amount of challenge in classifying. We can only triage, you know, certain situations like we had uh, finding out merits or being able to say whether this is representative. So at the most, in, when we're dealing with something primary, I think uh, we can only at the most say whether it's representative. And I think that's the safe way to uh, handle a frozen for a perhaps primary. Would you be able to at least tell whether this is a benign lesion or whether this is a malignant lesion? Because the surgeon wants to know that if it's a solid tumor, he may want to curate it when he's gone and done the biopsy. And if it is a malignant tumor, then obviously he's going to wait till the final report comes before he decides the treatment. So it depends upon what we see, because if we see a frankly malignant, any round cell, I'm just giving different scenarios or pleomorphic cells, we can say, well, that's malignant. But if we see something uh, like a fibrosis lesion, which is perhaps something, you know, low grade, that could be a challenge uh, to classify at that time. Something high grade, obvious, one can pick perhaps. Uh, but something which is uh, low grade or we are dealing with the fibrosis, I would defer. We have Dr. Borges, ma'am, here. So maybe, you know, uh, ma'am could uh, add to. Well, I think you said it all, uh, Bharat. See, you know, when you're doing a frozen section, uh, a frozen section is not always definitive. And I think Bharat has said it adequately. This is a child. And if this is going to be malignant, what are we expecting as a malignant tumor in this sort of scenario. It, it's either a Ewing's or it is, a, you know, a conventional high-grade osteosarcoma or some other uh, uh, sort of disease that if it is malignant. And that at least I think you would be able to say on a frozen section that it is not a Ewing's, it is not, you know, a high-grade malignant uh, tumor or something that is really high-grade. If it is not that, then I think, you know, it hardly matters that, uh, you know, when you have, whether this is a benign uh, thing, whether it is a benign um, fibrosis lesion, or in the case of something that may be um, fibrous histiocytoma, or, you know, some other sort of, that's, that's um, quite different. So what we can do at frozen section is divide, uh, you know, you can say that this is not a high grade, a malignant tumor, which is what you would expect in a child. And this is something that is likely to be either low grade or entirely benign. And I think that's good enough information for uh, the, the treating physician. So, yeah, so, so again, back to the surgeons is that now what would be your plan? Suppose you've done the biopsy and as Madam said, you had the information that this is a benign fibrosis tumor. How would you approach this patient? Uh, it is for I don't know. Continue another. Continue you. I uh, would, okay. would you would you curate this tumor, bone graft it, and and put in a plate, or would you fix it with a nail? What would be your uh, approach here? I mean, how would you treat this patient? For me, if it's a fibro dysplasia or benign fibro histiocytoma or whatever of this fibrous tumor, always there are some controversy about what we do with that. Probably, I don't do that anyway, no. Uh, probably, I don't know, a plate and could be, that is the controversy, I do that to put intramedullary allografts you know, in order to, because the fibrous dysplasia eating the, 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 the bone grafts, and probably I will go with a plate and intramedullary, intramedullary allograph. But I will talk with my, with, my, with my partners. But I don't want, probably I don't do the tense. I don't know. No. Prakash? So uh, I'd agree with Dr. Eduardo. So the fact that there's been a, a transverse fracture, a very low uh, trauma fracture, 
Uh, I'd suspect the bone's very weak. I would want a bone graft. I would do some curettage, and my first preference would probably uh, be a plate. I don't see these segments to be too long. Um, and yes, I would use uh, some combination of a short strut in that segment uh, with some morselized graft uh, right at the fracture site uh, and give it the best chance of a quick union, uh, knowing very well that if it is indeed a fibrous dysplasia, uh, very likely the graft is uh, going to be resorbed over time. Uh, but my preference would be to plate it. Yeah, so, so unfortunately, this... Uh, the surgeon who first saw him uh, uh, consulted a pediatric orthopedic surgeon and they decided that this should be treated like a cyst and they put in the nail. And when they put in the nail, I think they had some doubt in their mind that this is not a cyst. And, and then they, they opened up the fracture site and, and collected some material from there and did a biopsy, which of course they didn't have frozen section facilities, so they didn't have the report at that time. And this is what it showed. Finally, uh, they did not curate the tumor. They actually just nailed it and, and they've just taken a biopsy from the fracture site. And this has been reported as a benign fibrous histiocytoma. So uh, what happens now? How do we treat it now? Now you know that the nail has actually contaminated the intramedullary canal. But this is a benign tumor. Uh, I, at this moment, <clears throat> I will stay to pray. I don't want to go again to the, to the, to, to new surgery. <clears throat> I will carefully watch what's going on, but I don't want to, because it's, you start with a new surgery, play, whatever, and probably com more complication and more complication. Probably I watch carefully. But be, be careful because it was not the not, was not the the, the 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 nice treatment. But no more surgery for now. Correct. So that's that's exactly what we did. I mean, we just told this patient to be under observation, and this mm -hmm. patient never came back to us. So I assume all is fine. So I don't have a long term follow up. But I'm just telling you that these are the problems that we can get to if 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 we try to fix a pathological fracture without having all the information on it. So all the imaging was done, but I don't think all that imaging was analyzed. So the message from these two cases is that not all fractures in a child are going to be because of a simple bone cyst. I think one has to be alert that occasionally you could get some other lesions and the plan has to be made according to that. And you must get all the information before one goes and does the surgery, even for a child. So I'm now going to come to the other age group. Now, this, this is a 12-year-old girl who was playing kabaddi in school. But, I mean, without any violent trauma, just while standing, she felt something snap and fell down. And she, then she was taken, into, uh, taken to the emergency room of the local hospital. And the surgeon who saw it uh, went ahead and did a fixation. Now, the first question is, is, is this a pathological fracture? I mean, do you have any doubts? She has never had history of pain uh, before this episode. Uh, she just uh, fell on the field. We, we know this is a trivial trauma, but probably this history was not available to the surgeon at the, at the time, or he never bothered to elicit this history. But is there any evidence that this could be a pathological fracture from the X-rays? It's quite... Uh... Obvious, there is a lytic lesion, slightly expansile in the distal diaphysis. You can also see a periosteal reaction on the uh, medial aspect. Yeah. And uh, also there are some linear sclerosis. Basically, it's uh, definitely a lesion. I mean, I would be worried about osteogenic sarcoma because of that periosteal reaction. But it looks like a very well-defined lesion, isn't it? I mean, why, why not a fracture through a simple bone cyst like we've seen? Not the site for a simple bone cyst. It's distal but, uh, It's moved a little proximal, started in the metaphyseal area, has moved as the child has yeah, grown. You know, but distal femur is, you have to have a high index of suspicion for malignancy, unless you have evidence. Yes, this the is general, that's a very... it's malignancy, unless proven otherwise, then if you find that it's uh, benign, great. But this is, this is not the humerus. Also, now, uh, 
you know, so, uh, the surgeon's notes at the time of fixation say that they found some abnormal brownish red tissue all around the fracture site when they've gone to fix it. And you can clearly see that after the fixation, this looks completely different from the X-ray which was there pre-op. And, and I'm not surprised that this, this did uh, show an osteosarcoma. So now again, back to the surgeons is, what do you do now? You should ask Bharat things? and Anita to comment on the cystopath. No? Sorry, just to bring some levity. <laughs> well, I don't think this is a challenge for the pathologist at all. No, because they... No, 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 show that slide again. Show that slide again. Let, 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 let them look. Ha, now diagnose osteosarcoma on this. Well, it says it's a highly cellular sarcoma. Am I composed of pleomorphic round cells? Somebody has described it, you know. It's, uh, okay. That's fine. No, I was thinking the are... image on black and white and see if you can make the diagnosis. No, of course I can't. This is, uh, this is a gimmick, you know, putting a... This uh, I, know, I, I mean, I mean it, it is a pointless thing. I mean, it's a futile effort of giving a black and white picture. Yeah, yeah I know. It's a, it's a gimmick which uh, a lot of pathologists uh, use nowadays because patients get impressed. I hope that their orthopedic surgeons don't get it, uh, impressed. But <laughs> Madam, the orthopedic surgeons can't diagnose even from a color picture. Forget, leave alone a black and white picture. I know, but never the, nevertheless... A lot of these gimmicks are for to impress somebody. So I hope it's only the patient and not the orthopedic surgeon. Yeah, so what do we do now? The question for these surgeons is now we have a patient who's had extensive contamination. Mm -hmm. the, and it's, I, a, it's a high grade pleomorphic osteosarcoma. I, I see this patient, despite of all these mistakes, have, have a luck, good luck, because the, 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 the orthopedic surgeon didn't put a nail. If he put a nail, it's uh, horrible. He put a plate, he go obviously external. So if we want to make a, a limb salvage surgery, we, we are far away of the vessels. Probably all the hematoma from the for the surgery was in the in the vastus lateralis, and go to the wide interarticular resection like that. But the issue is my question to the medical oncologist at this time: you now you go directly to surgery or go now with the chemo neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then surgery. That's my question for the medical oncologist in the, in the, in the board. So Sachin, Mozambel. So most of these patients we will uh, take up for newer joint chemotherapy. In fact, you know, even without pathological fractures, we as a protocol currently are giving newer joint chemotherapy for most of our osteosarcomas. Uh, definitely in this case where we have a lot of issues about contamination, micromed, seeding and all those things. I think uh, newer joint chemotherapy should be the treatment of choice. And having said that, you know, with path fractures, we have quite a few cases and quite a number of cases, actually, where we have end up giving a good limb salvage surgery. So, so Mike, I'm going to put this question a little differently. Suppose this was recognized as a pathological fracture and a biopsy was done and it was an osteosarcoma. So the question for the surgeons is that what is the need for fixation? Is there a need for fixation because the patient is quite uncomfortable? And if you're going to give new adjuvant chemotherapy, it's going to be 10 weeks before the patient comes up for surgery. So should we, should we fix it? Or should we operate first and then give chemotherapy so that the patient is a little more comfortable during the chemotherapy? Prakash, go you. Yes. So <laughs> I'll have absolutely, uh, thank you, Dr. Eduardo. I'll absolutely have no hesitation at all. I would not operate up front. Uh, I would opt for new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, I would immobilize them and most kids would have excellent response and go on to healing uh, very often after the first chemotherapy cycle. Uh, they have significant reduction in pain. 
we usually tend to offer surgery after three uh, cycles of chemotherapy. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of uh, kids who, who get systemic therapy um, have good response. Uh, the fractures would heal. Uh, the limb salvage rates would be uh, high. Um, and the local control would be better. So uh, I have no doubts that I would not offer immediate surgery and would choose to give new adjuvant therapy. Over. Eduardo? 100% agree with Prakash. Right. So I, I think the message is gone uh, very clear that uh, even though this is a pathological fracture, there is no urgency of fixation. It is important to get the diagnosis because once you give them proper neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the chance of getting a local rec recurrence would become much lesser because once the fracture heals and the tumor becomes better marginated, it's much easier for the surgeon to ensure a proper margin when they're doing a resection. Now, if you went in a, at this time in a fresh pathological fracture, I think it is very difficult to ensure that you've got clean margins all around and you don't know where the hematoma is tracked and you don't even know then finally what has been the response to chemotherapy to be able to prognosticate. So I think all in all, when we see an osteosarcoma or an healing sarcoma with a pathological fracture, I think the message here is don't worry about the fracture. You splint the patient, you start the patient on uh, proper neoadjuvant chemotherapy and then take your decision for surgery once you've got the induction chemotherapy done. We go to the next case now, a different age group. This is a 41-year-old man who's had pain for a month in, around his hip, uh, but he was ignoring it. He didn't get any x-rays done. He took some painkillers, but uh, finally he just uh, fell down uh, uh, when he was walking in his house. And it's more like he fractured and then he fell down. And these were the x-rays when he presented to the hospital. So again, like uh, what Dr. Chaffee had shown, this is you, you've got a fractured neck femur in a 41-year-old man. So again, now question to uh, the radiologists as well as the surgeons, how should we approach this? I mean, what are the guidelines now in such a patient? We don't have any prior history of any malignancy. He's never been worked up. All we know that he's had some pain for a month prior to this history of uh, fracture. Bhavin, Chinmay, Santosh, can you? So, I mean, there is a lot of osteoporosis, apart from the fact that we have an osteolytic lesion here. And he's 41. So you are looking and thinking of Metz myeloma lymphoma or a secondary bone tumor, as we would call it. And when you have so much profound osteoporosis, unless this is metabolic or nutritional, you want to make sure that you're not missing a myeloma. But that's, that's we're jumping the gun. The point is there is an osteolytic lesion and we need to know what this is with the understanding that it's likely to be a non-primary uh, bone tumor. Now, uh, like, like I asked Dr. Chaffe, how comfortable would anybody be operating this, getting a frozen section done and then deciding what to do? Or should we first get all the imaging done, do a biopsy in the traditional way and then decide what to do? Because with a, with a fracture neck femur, the patient is extremely uncomfortable. They're in pain, they're admitted to the hospital and you need to do, do get things done quickly. Well, uh, if I if I go in first, I think investing a, a couple of days or a little more in getting more information on what the source of the lesion is, if it is indeed a metastatic carcinoma or a myeloma, and in the rare instance to rule out a, a primary bone sarcoma, which is lower down on the list for this age group, is a time is effort and time well invested. Uh, so I wouldn't hurry into surgery on day one. Uh, definitely put them in, in traction, give them very good pain relief, uh, do uh, a basic set of uh, serum tumor markers, uh, schedule an immediate uh, FTG, a PET CT, um, and then proceed with my plan. So, so Dr. Rangarajan, the question to you now is, uh, what do you expect from a PET CT in this patient? What kind of information can you give the surgeon 
if he were to ask or request the pet ct in this case well uh, one of the things in uh, with pet ct is it's very good when we deal with osteolytic lesion uh, and uh, we will be first and foremost able to see the whole body in one go and we will get an idea whether we are dealing with a localized disease or it is a multiple disease whether it involves the vertebra so uh, the after reading the pet scan one could say whether we are actually dealing with say a multiple myeloma or whether we are dealing with um, yes uh, yeah secondary from uh, uh, yeah nostrolytic metastasis from some other primary like thyroid so i would say that uh, that would give a lot of information but of course on its own it would uh, not give all the information and one other additional information it could give is whether there is another convenient site from where you could take a biopsy so on the whole i would put it as histopathology immunohistochemistry as one one part of the important part of the track along with reading the fdg pet ct in this particular case both of them together would make all the sense so that's the mr which is being done again i want input from the radiologists now that you have these images would you would you do a biopsy or would you straight away go in for surgery i think this lesion looks aggressive and needs a biopsy at 41 of course the meds myeloma lymphoma would be high on the list yeah yes yeah, so if if we have to biopsy this and the patient is sent to you where would you biopsy it from and the lesion is in the neck so would you go from the front or would you go from the side and would you get a frozen section done to be sure that you've got representative tissue because most likely you'll have to do this uh, biopsy under anesthesia yeah, if i do a biopsy i will go from lat i was i i am thinking about the 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 next surgery if we need to make a surgery if i am thinking in that we need a surgery i will go for netrocounter i will say to the radiologist i need to go my access could be from the trochanter lateral and to take the biopsy i don't want to go in front or neither posterior i don't know what this what you said the radiologist No, no. I was going to say that I will ask you, and you have to tell me how to biopsy. Exactly. I mean, what I would have done with it. That's a good point. Prakash, I was waiting for that answer. <laughs> no, Prakash will agree that if if I don't tell the radiologist, they will always go from the front. In fact, in these cases, I have to tell the radiologist that you have to go from the side, because my approach, should this turn out to be a malignant and require a resection, is going to be from the side. so i would prefer a biopsy from the trochanter i don't want a biopsy from the front which would be very difficult tract to excise if i have to excise the biopsy tract but o- over the period of time we have learned that uh, we would not uh, independently uh, do or choose the tract without c- consulting the orthopedic oncologist exactly for these reasons because we have seen uh things getting messed up because of wrong uh, biopsy tract so okay. as a rule anirudh we tell everybody that you it is important that the surgeon should mark his line of incision when he sends the patient for a biopsy so that the radiologist knows exactly what's going to be the incision and he can place his biopsy along that line absolutely we are lucky because all our patients come from your office and they have a mark made and so we can just follow that line i'm, I'm sure bhavin gets a lot of patients without the mark chinmay bhavin what do you say yeah so i have to call somebody if the treating if if the referring doctor is an orthopedic onco surgeon then i call <coughs> that person and if the referring doctor is somebody else it could be anybody from a family physician to an orthopedic surgeon to anyone then i would call you <laughs> that's as simple as that so No, so so it's important because otherwise it, uh, the easiest approach is anterior it's very tempting to go anterior but in this case i think the message is that you should not it has to be planned according to what we are <coughs> going to uh, operate from now any any clue from this image is as to whether this is benign or malignant or what kind of histology this is 
Anish, can I make a point here? You know, we were yes, discussing sir. about biopsy. You know, just a word of caution uh, that uh, in this age, with this kind of a lesion, it could also be a myeloma. So, uh, if you uh, so you better go ahead and do your myeloma markers before you put in your needle for a biopsy. So, if you have a myeloma, you could possibly avoid doing a biopsy from that side. Yeah, so so that is a part of the workup. So that's what we said. We would do the blood workup. Yes. So I just wanted to emphasize on that point that you know don't do your radiology and straight away go ahead and do a biopsy. Keep this as in mind, and you may uh, have a diagnosis before a uh, formal biopsy. So this is what the MRI report said. Now again, we come to this point is that how much should a orthopedic surgeon rely on the radiologist's report when he himself is not able to tell what this lesion is? Radiologists, any, any, anybody, or Eduardo, how much do you rely on the on the reports which have come from radiologists who may not be experts on musculoskeletal radiology? I don't, I don't rely, I don't believe in them exactly. Always, all the patient that came to my hospital has to be reviewed by our our specialized radiologists. Yeah, so, so again, probably I don't know if this radiology. I don't know that the radiologist could be very good, but probably is digestive or or tidal radiologist and is making the the, 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 the the interpretation of musculoskeletal tumor. Anyway, if you see the the, the, the the report, he said or she said a chondroid lesion. That's the issue that probably the the the, the, the surgeon has to be ready to say, hey, could be fibrodysplasia, could be chondroid lesion, could be chondrosarcoma. So he he needs more, more, more information. Not go to the directly to the bipolar amyotrophy. Well, that's usually what happens. So this uh, orthopedic surgeon uh, uh, went ahead and did a hemiarthroplasty and uh, did send the material for pathology. And this is what uh, the report I could get. I could not get these slides somehow. But this is the report which we got. It said it's an inflammatory myofibroblastic tumor. And in fact, uh, I think these slides were reviewed and uh, the second report said it's a spindle cell sarcoma, but there was no action taken. Um, after a year, the patient had severe pain when walking and he's come to us like this. So now, now the question again for the surgeons, what do we do now? Uh, Prakash, you want uh, to? It's it's uh, it's a disaster. Yeah, it's 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 a disaster, and I Absolutely. I assume that they they would have had a, a long uh, posterior approach. Um, there would be a lot of contamination of the gluteus maximus, contamination all around the sciatic nerve. Uh, I can see lysis in the acetabular sourcil. Uh, I'm afraid uh, that this gentleman is looking at. Uh, an amputation, probably an external uh, hemipelvectomy uh, for a high-grade sarcoma. Assuming, of course, that we stage him, uh, we are sure that he's non-metastatic. And then in a curative setting, uh, it's best to get a safe uh, R0 margin. And I'm afraid this may be an external hemipelvectomy. The, 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 the issue is what happened after the surgeon saw the biopsy. If the biopsy said this is a coma, why he's waiting for one year to follow the case? Probably at, the, at that time he can he he, he, uh, he can he has to refer the patient and see what's going on now, but not waiting for a year after after surgery. He had the report that this is a coma. I don't know. So that's the whole point uh, that we are going to make with this case is, is a pathological fracture has to be taken very seriously, particularly in somebody who is not very old. I mean, 40 is a young patient. 
uh, by any standards and and when you have a report which is not a metastatic cancer and it's it's is probably a primary bone tumor i think uh, that report should have been taken seriously and and a follow up should have been done the patient should have been referred in fact the patient should have been referred even before the surgery was done because now this is a hot bed for litigation because the moment i tell the patient that he needs a hind quarter amputation i think the question is going to ask me is that was my primary surgery correct and i don't know what answer to give i, I mean edward what would you tell the patient and i'm telling you this because this patient did ask me this question is that was my previous surgery done right <laughs> this is a uh, very difficult i don't know what to say the patient because i don't want to put in problem to the surgeons uh, to my colleagues uh, it's very difficult ethical question uh, i don't know really i would like to say the patient somebody has a mistake and and now you you need a uh, you 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 need an external hemipelvectomy but i don't know how to say that to the patient i don't know i translate the question to you yeah, so so uh, finally the lesson that uh, i i think that goes from this case is is to treat the pathological fracture very carefully before uh, a disaster happens because it's a, it's a hot bed for litigation if if uh, something like this was to happen and i i don't think anybody can defend the primary surgeon here because uh, uh, there was no attempt at uh, uh, taking any action even after the final report came the pathology report came so there is there is a lot of problem here so one this question one this question for the this was a high grade pleomorphic uh, sarcoma when we did the pathology it was a uh, uh, i mean they couldn't subtype it into an exact kind of sarcoma it didn't fit into any particular kind of sarcoma and that's why we've called it as an undifferentiated pleomorphic uh, sarcoma of the bone which is very unusual the way it has presented extremely unusual so we, uh, this patient also you can see there is a gluteal seeding from the previous surgery so we we now know that extensive contamination has happened and there is no way we can do anything less than a hind quarter amputation here to get margins because fortunately the patient was still not metastatic now the question to dr rangrajan is that most of the time when a pet ct is done for such cases there are two problems that we find is that uh, uh, they don't do a separate breath hold ct thorax and uh, there is no imaging done uh, below the knee or actually below mid thigh now uh, what are the rules here i mean what what that is wrong that is actually wrong because uh, it is just like uh, uh, if bavin says that he is a, a musculoskeletal radiologist the same way there is an acquisition protocol which is separate for each particular pathology like for example when we are dealing with uh, any orthopedic especially malignant lesions in the in the extremities in the limbs we have to have a vertex to the not to the to the toe we have to have a whole body scan that's number 1 second thing is if you follow any of our tata memorial protocols we always have a breath hold ct breath hold ct is as good as a stand alone ct chest except that it is not uh, contrast enhanced and uh, if if we are going to do a contrast enhanced ct as a part of the regular protocol in the early venous phase that would also be there so we would provide almost you can say four full sets of uh, the radiological and the uh, the metabolic data so i think uh, whatever you said that what was your requirement would be provided and the another advantage is when in when when you have a properly done whole body pet ct you can you can also use it you can actually measure and you can use like the dimensions although you can say it, it may not be perfect as an mri but it at least it will give you a very good idea for you to plan the surgery and therefore i feel the appropriate acquisition protocols have to be done properly one uh, acquisition protocol for one for of ftg pet for all the various specialty is absolutely wrong and i think those people need to be updated so anyway this this patient uh, went on to get a hind quarter amputation and and uh, unfortunately a year later also had metastatic disease and died of metastatic disease and that's what happens when so much delay has happened between uh, starting treatment so 
the, the, a very strong uh, message here would be that uh, one should not do any surgery without a workup in any pathological fracture. Dr. Manish, can I make a comment here? Yeah. So uh, now we have done the workup. This patient came after one year actually. So, yes. And it's a pleomorphic sarcoma. So would a neoadjuvant chemotherapy be a better plan followed by a amputation or directly amputation? Because I think the data will not be very clear because it's a one year gap and that to a pleomorphic sarcoma. Well, uh, you know, it's a very difficult question to answer and a lot depends on, um, uh, I mean, what does the patient want? Now, uh, we did try to give him chemo. We, we, I normally would give them chemotherapy first, at least two cycles, and try to assess whether we are getting any kind of response because uh, an undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma is not going to respond as well as maybe an osteosarcoma or an evening sarcoma would have responded. So, uh, here there is a, uh, one worry that whether you are going to push the patient into more delay and, and risk getting metastatic disease and and that's a further hotbed for litigation again because you may be accused of further delaying the treatment even after they've come. So I think it's it's good to have a discussion with the patient and generally before you do something so morbid, I generally advise my patient that you should take the new adjuvant chemotherapy because it is worth doing such a major amputation only if you have shown some response. Now if on the new adjuvant chemotherapy I find that the patient has developed metastatic disease, then I think I would rather send him for palliative supportive care rather than uh, a major amputation like this. Yeah, so, so that uh, sounds a better plan uh, to give chemo. Oh, choose the right patient for the right surgery kind of a therapeutic window approach versus yes. directly. Yes, and, and two cycles of chemotherapy actually does not take much time. It's, it's about six weeks. And if you were to get a response, and I think Dr. Rangarajan will tell us that if I do a PET even after two cycles of chemo, even though I don't see a, a size reduction of disease, I can actually tell from the metabolic activity whether I am seeing some response of chemo. Yes, absolutely right. Metabolic response is something you can very well pick up after two cycles. No problem. Uh, Manish, I think uh, this would be a fair approach actually to consider chemotherapy before uh, offering some uh, morbid kind of surgery for this patient. Yeah. So, Eduardo, what would you do? I, I, I don't know, but I think in this case, I will try to make a, when made the biopsy of this, I will try to make a chemotherapy because I know that the patient has very bad prognosis and before to go to the, to the, for, to the external hemipelvectomy, I will, I will push for chemotherapy, but multidisciplinary decision. I'm Dr. talking Manish. to the family, patient. Dr. Manish? Yeah? If by chance the chemotherapy response is there, is it going to change your surgical approach? Well, no. I, I think in this particular case, as Prakash had pointed out, there has been extensive contamination even of the sciatic nerve. And uh, that, that would preclude. And look at that mass in the gluteal area. That itself is a pointer to the amount of contamination which has happened. So I think if you're going to take the patient with a curative intent, we're going to treat him with a curative intent. I think you have this one last chance of getting rid of the disease without leaving behind any residual disease. Mm. And that would only be happen with a hindquarter amputation, unfortunately. There is acetabular disease, there is a femoral disease, there is gluteal disease. I don't think we can retain any uh, enough of soft tissue for any satisfactory function, even if we try to do a limb-saving surgery here. So... Here, I would not consider any, any kind of limb salvage. No. This is one, so one uh, point of uh, perspective that uh, I might add is, so I would tend to base this decision on the morbidity that the patient has currently. We've had a few patients who are in excruciating pain, who are bedridden. And in those individuals where my margin's not going to change, my plan of external hemipelvectomy is not going to change with new adjuvant therapy, uh, I might, in fact, choose to offer them external hemipelvectomy up front, uh, which would significantly resolve them of their pain, help them get out of bed, and help them tolerate their adjuvant chemotherapy better. Because if this is indeed a, a undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma coming from bone, we would offer them you know, chemo. 
And so some perspective to base that decision on the performance status when the patient's in the clinic. Over. Manish, I have a comment to make here. Uh, this is regarding the natural history that you wanted to assess using chemotherapy. Now, we know that this patient had a sarcoma, high-grade sarcoma, one year back, and the patient went on without any treatment for a year, and now has come up with this kind of a disease. Now, don't you think that is uh, good enough information for us to know about the natural history? And I would possibly go by what Prakash says. If you already know about the natural history of the disease, and as long as you can get the disease out, possibly it's a better idea to go ahead and do surgery now because we know that we don't have effective chemotherapy for this kind of disease. Well, I have, uh, I have been surprised at times with the kind of response we've got, even with chemotherapy in, in cases which don't respond. So I would definitely give two cycles of chemotherapy upfront before doing something as morbid as a hind quarter amputation. I mean, you are right that one year has passed and there is no metastatic disease at the time of our evaluation now. But I think you need to give time to the patient also to mentally accept the hindquarter amputation. It's not easy. And they take some time. And if he, if, he, if he insists on doing surgery first, then we've lost some precious time. So what we do is to put them onto chemotherapy. They have some time to think over and accept mentally that they, they will go in for an amputation and then go ahead and do it after two cycles of chemo. You also had time to evaluate because people who've responded to the chemo are very have a better chance of being cured after doing a hindquarter amputation. And, and then I'm a little happier doing a hindquarter amputation knowing that it's being done with a curative intent. And this un, undefined pleomorphic do respond to chemo. You know, they are usually high grade. They have a better chance to respond than any other soft tissue sarcomas. So yeah, they, think, uh, they, they don't respond like osteo and evings. No, but no, they osteo and evings is a different ball game altogether. We're talking about the soft tissue ones. So, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah, but they do respond. So they do respond they do. and uh, the, that's why we, it's, it's worth giving them the chemo. In fact, you know, I mean, I would like to, uh, Bharat or Madam to comment that, you know, uh, we have cases of, uh, you know, treating them with immunotherapy. So there are some cases which, do, which are PDL one positive. So even if they're metastatic, we have, you know, uh, some experience of treating them and uh, response. So I think, uh, Bharat, uh, uh, do you do PDL one in this group of patients? Oh, Just out of interest asking. Yes, so that's a very exciting area, Dr. Muzamil, in immunotherapy, when there are very little options in sarcomas where you can actually try immuno. You know, the success stories in melanoma and maybe some alveolar soft part sarcomas. Now, this uh, pleomorphic sarcoma, undifferentiated pleomorphic sarcoma, which is rich in inflammatory cells, uh, these tumors now are being offered, identified with, you know, uh, possibilities of immunotherapy because of the immune environment that these tumors have so in soft tissues which generally rm uh, get to know are chemo uh, less sensitive in contrast to the other like synovial so these are less chemo sensitive but uh, there's excitement towards you know this inflammatory old school mfh now pleomorphic sarcomas or ups where immunotherapy is being so we have tried pdl1 expression we have got those requests and i think i've seen in lyomyo PDL1 positivity and an occasional case of pleomorphic sarcoma inflammatory or UPS. Uh, maybe Madam can also share her experience related to these tumors. Well, I don't have much experience with uh, PDL1, but I just wanted to make a comment, Manish. Um, yeah. This is such a huge uh, tumor. It has recurred. It doesn't matter. It has recurred after one year. It's a very high grade sarcoma. I don't think we can really talk about curative intent. What you're doing, you're doing this hindquarter amputation, correct me if I'm wrong, not because you're trying to cure this tumor and this patient, but you're wanting to save him from a lot of morbidity. You can't leave that uh, patient with that kind of uh, thing there when you can actually do something to um, reduce the you know, the pain and morbidity of this, this lesion. I don't think you're going to cure this tumor. And it was inevitable, whatever you did, you know, including PDL one and everything else, you would in, uh, increase his, his lifespan, but at least he would have a quality of life where he wasn't, you know, just um, lying in, in bed in pain and in, uh, you know, with a great deal of morbidity. You're absolutely correct, ma'am, because, uh, 
even when we have analyzed all our cases of hind quarter amputation you find that hardly 10% of them are long term survivors and Absolutely. those are the ones which have shown exceptional response to uh, the adjuvant therapy or they have a pathology which responds so uh, yes uh, but it's very difficult i mean despite all this it's very difficult we found to convince the patient that they should immediately go for a hind quarter because many of our patients actually never come back to us once we tell them that you you need a hind quarter amputation and uh, we've had patients who've gone and had some uh, uh, palliative surgery or some uh, funny kind of limb salvage with the tumor coming back once again and this this is a bane but uh, they they very often will tell us that we would rather die than to accept a hind quarter amputation and that's been a problem for us yeah that's a patient choice manish but you know in your mind that you, what you're offering is surgery to give a, a relatively better quality of life than somebody just lying there with this this painful and obviously yes yes yes, 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 yes. but ma'am we we do have a, a very small number of patients who do get cured so so i i think yeah. at the back I, of the mind we are always agree, optimistic but but, uh, but not this kind of uh, sarcoma you know it would be something like a, yes something is that is responsive case. to treat. Let's go on to the next one. I don't think we have too much time left. I think maybe we've just have uh, one more case and this is a young boy again on on the while running on the football field he fell down. He had a fracture. He was taken to a big hospital. Uh, a quick uh, thing from the radiologist what do you think is the possible pathology? So there is a plastic lesion seen in the mid diaphysis, and definitely it like looks like a aggressive lesion because the proximally. Very defined to me, Santosh, it, it looks extremely well defined. Yeah, but proximally, if you see the the zone, it's not looking good. Anyway, I would yeah. like to MR or something to see the lesion better. Prakash, Eduardo, what do you think? I see. the patient needs a more image needs an, an mri something wrong is there something very wrong so that doesn't happen so the surgeon does this and he convinces himself that the intramedullary reamings that he's going to send he's going to give him the diagnosis the pathologist reports on frozen section that the intramedullary reamings don't have any tumor so he uh, he's happy he's any case he's already reamed across and he's put in the nail his working diagnosis was a simple bone cyst and uh, it actually starts to heal but his swelling in the thigh keeps uh, growing and this is how he presents to us when the swelling doesn't stop growing and now he is biopsy and this is again a high grade uh, pleomorphic sarcoma So again, this is a classic case which is highlighting all the problems of rushing into a fixation, particularly with a nail, without having a workup. And as Eduardo correctly said, I mean, an MRI would have given us the diagnosis here, and would, a biopsy would have told us what this is and and prevented us. And again, we discussed it before. If if you have to fix it, please fix it with a plate. Don't fix it with a nail if you don't know what it is, because then at least you can salvage. in a, in a better way so uh, uh, this ended up with a total femur replacement and and i think the most of the indications for us doing a total femur replacement are cases like this where uh, something wrong has been done what do you think edwardo yeah i seen this, this similar to the previous case the patient needs a uh, chemotherapy and then need this kind of surgery also has probably a skip meds in a uh, skip med in the in the femur in the trochanter the skip metastasis i don't know or rodin sarcoma this is a rodin sarcoma no skip med that is very teaching picture because it's a rodin sarcoma go with the nail to the to the to the trochanter horrible we don't want this i think this is the the point that you want to show to everybody this is we don't want to have this this kind of cases horrible and you can actually see here you can see the tumor which has spread along the nail exactly rodin sarcoma 
Now, similarly, this, this is another patient who, again, a um, young patient who had a femur fracture, no workup, nailing done. But uh, somehow the surgeon decided after the nailing that he should do a biopsy. After the nailing, he does the biopsy. You can see that incision. You can see some staples on the median side, on the lateral side. And, and this turns out to be a, a chondrosarcoma. So again, again, the same uh, lesson is, is, I mean, uh, this becomes a difficult situation to do a, a salvage, but being chondrosarcoma, we do a total femur. So again, the same message is, is, is that a workup is, is absolutely essential before we decide what to do. And this is going to be the last case uh, that we are going to show. And this is a 53-year-old lady, no prior history of any disease, felt a muscle pull, just collapsed, was brought to the hospital, x-rays were done, there's a fracture neck femur, which is an ab obvious pathological fracture. Uh, a chest x-ray was done and, and you can see a very clear lesion. So now my question uh, to both Prakash and to Edward, you already know that they, this looks like a primary lung cancer with a metastasis to the femur. How do you approach this? I mean, with, with just x-rays, you've got a diagnosis here. I, I, I think I am that kind of lesion, osteolytic lesion. I am, despite that these uh, are uh, lung meds and probably half a mod, more metastasis, probably, I don't know, but if anyway, if you have more metastasis, I will do a prosthesis. I prefer prosthesis in the proximal femur than uh, any kind of osteosynthesis. It's more stable. Uh, if we put a, a nail or, or some internal fixation, if the patient is living longer, that the, the tumor came back, I, I will go to the prosthesis, tumoral prosthesis. Yeah, but, but it looks like there is a disease in the suprastabular area as well. Excuse in this me? case, would that change your management? Excuse me again. I didn't. I didn't understand. There is some disease in the on the acetabular side. Uh, I don't put nothing in the acetabulum. I will go to the to the to the bipolar prosthesis and probably irradiation. But it's, if, if we go the tumoral prosthesis and we put a total hip replacement with acetabulum, could be very unstable. We need that this patient will be nice for the few days that he has or for the few time with that. I don't know with that. I don't like the, 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 the total hip replacement with the, with the tumoral prosthesis. We don't have soft tissue to maintain. Yeah, now I don't know, biopsy but, this. Now my question to you is where you seem to, we seem to have a diagnosis here. Do ah, I need a biopsy? I, it's, it's, if we got one of a biopsy, we we'll go biopsy lateral. The lung or should I biopsy the bone? The bone. Easy. Uh, uh, Muzamil, uh, Sachin, I mean, when, when you do a biopsy here, and I know that this is a lung, are you okay with usual histopathology or you do want that we send the EGFR and the ALK uh, markers to be done as well? So, uh, you know, this is a female, a 53 year old. So yeah. now this is a new disease as far as lung cancer is concerned. So biopsy is important. Uh, primary is the more preferred site uh, for, you know, knowing the biology. But I mean, if someone is doing a bone biopsy because it is easier to do, I will agree with that. What we require is the more information about the biology of the disease. Because now if this is, these are EGFR positive patients, they can live somewhere around three and a half to five years which has changed dramatically as compared to three months or six months earlier, you know. So I think biopsy is mandatory. Which side is a matter of convenience, I guess. Yeah, even I would prefer getting it from the primary side, if possible. And uh, yes, it is mandatory that we send it off for all the mutational analysis because that uh, actually has changed the way that we manage lung cancers. And as uh, Dr. Sheikh really uh, put it well, that most of these patients would do well, extremely well for quite a few years so even your perspective in managing the fracture also would change knowing the fact that they are going to do well for a long time 
Correct. So I, I think uh, you guys have put a very important message that we should not assume that this is a patient who's going to have a very short lifespan. Though we are seeing a lung cancer with stage four disease, I think if they turn out to be an EGFR positive uh, patient, uh, the prognosis can be still very good. And whatever we use to fix this fracture has to be something which will survive that long. I mean, as as David pointed out in his talks earlier, I think. The construct has to last longer than the patient, and that's that's a rule that we have to follow. Now, now the question to the radiologist is: is uh, when you do these biopsies, I mean, how complicated is it to collect this material for these additional studies for the EGFR receptor and for the ALK receptors? I mean, uh, how, uh, do you routinely do it if you knew that this is lung cancer and let's say you are biopsying the lung, knowing that this could be a lung cancer? It it is the same biopsies or nothing else, no, nothing different has to be done. Uh, we just have to send it uh, in the same formalin, nothing else. So again, that message is that it is not anything complicated. It's just that you have to ask for these tests. But sometimes, uh, sometimes these lytic lesions are difficult to yield a good amount of tissue. So primary, you know, is if it is accessible easily, gives us the better quality of tissue and quantity, which can be used for NGS and other other panels. So, doc, Dr. Rangarajan, my question to you is, is there a role of doing a PET CT scan now that I know the primary and I know there are multiple lesions in this patient, I can already see multiple skeletal lesions. Yes. Is there any role of doing a PET CT scan? Yes, yeah. I think PET CT, besides the staging, can we can also use it for our treatment response evaluation in this. And there is one other thing is that uh, some of this bone metastasis from lung carcinoma, uh, it, it depends on their, uh, the way they are expressing themselves. Uh, they could be more osteoblastic in nature. And if they are more osteoblastic, then, you know, we can treat them with any of the bisphosphonates, I mean, uh, radioisotope labeled phosphonates. Now we have the classical bisphosphonate, the, which we traditionally use, that is now labeled with lutetium-177, and that can also be treated. Yeah. So that could give a synergetic effect to at least the bone metastasis in this particular case. So I would use sequential FTG PET for uh, looking at the staging and the treatment response. And also I would consider giving a theranostic angle by using one of the bisphosphonates and labeling it with Letitia 177. All of them are now available. It's not a problem. So what kind of uh, surgery would you plan, Prakash, uh, Dr. Eduardo? So I think, uh, as Dr. Eduardo said, the, the best option here, the bone's completely destroyed. I do not think any internal fixation would last. Uh, the best option would be uh, the option that will give the quickest and the longest lasting mobility, which would be to resect the proximal femur along with the head and the neck uh, and use a proximal femur endoprosthesis, which would be cemented. Um, and that would get the patient out of bed with full weight bearing the soonest. Would you do an MRI? If I had a PET CT scan, would you still do an MRI to screen the so, bone? So, uh, oftentimes, the, the CT that's integrated as a part of the PET CT, if that has given me satisfactory uh, imaging to know what my margins are going to be, I would not necessarily uh, need an MRI. Uh, however, if the imaging is of a suboptimal quality, um, and I need to plan my margins, then I wouldn't hesitate uh, getting any further imaging that would help me plan my resection well. So that's the MR. The PET CT also picked up a lesion in the proximal humerus, but uh, the plain X-rays don't show any significant lytic lesion or risk of fracture. So like, like we said, uh, we, we need to now fix this. Now, is it important to estimate the survival, Dr. Eduardo? Yes, it's very important. Now, the point is, when we start to make aggressive treatment, there are many, many, many uh, reports, and, and it's in my theme, of, for my point of view, and some Japanese, some Japanese reports, I will go after two months. If the patient is liver two months, I will try to make a, a aggressive treatment. Sometimes 
the aggressive the, the, that is nice for the residents. Sometimes we see that the aggressive treatment, the less aggressive treatment is the is the nay. Probably the aggressive treatment the nay. In this case, for all of us, that we are very expert making uh, interartic uh, why interarticular resection of the proximal femur is could be easier than to put a, a nail. It could be this is a fracture. So uh, for me, it's important to estimate the survival. Which kind of table I use? My table is the oncologist, is the, is the, is the, is the multidisciplinary team, because as you know, Manish and Prakash and everybody, there are many tables, Valencian, but facts from people from Italy, from people from Memorial, but I think is the team. I have common sense with the oncologist, everything I say, how, how is this patient individual inside the case? And then we go. I don't know. That's my point of view. So I, I think, uh, think, uh, I, I think, how do you estimate yeah. the survival in such a patient? So there are a lot of, you know, uh, tables and logs and so many, you know, data for estimating. But, you know, those are all a little bit older. They're not fit for to be used today. And not in all cases is what I feel. And that's what Dr. Edward was pointing towards. A multidisciplinary team is the best way to move ahead. So, you know, a lot of information on the molecular, uh, you know, horizon is coming up for all tumors. Not only this, we have breast cancer patients, metastatic, extensive meds in the bones, living for 7 to 10 years now because of CDK4 inhibitors and many other molecules. So things have changed and they're changing very fast. We can't apply a table. We have to use uh, the multidisciplinary team to decide what is an probable estimate of survival for that particular patient and then freeze on it. No, one thing is very, very clear here that uh, because of the molecular analysis that we do for all these patients, uh, sequencing of the treatments uh, modalities which are available to us has also become very important. Like we have so many, like you first will start with say TKIs and then we'll move on to uh, immunotherapy. So overall, these patients are really going to do well, irrespective. And therefore, the foreign orthopedic uh, uh, oncologist who is going to fix that fracture, I think you have to uh, assume that the patient is going to do well with the recent developments that we have on hand. So now my question to both Dr. Kannan and to Siddharth is, uh, now we know that this patient has multiple lesions. Uh, uh, we know that femur is fractured, but there's a lesion in the acetabulum. And if I'm going to do a hemiarthroplasty, I need some control on that uh, acetabular lesion. What is the chance that this patient is going to heal with the radiation that you will give post-op? And how is that prosthesis going to interfere with the planning of your radiation post-surgery? Siddharth, you want it? I'll take. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, the first thing, prosthesis is not a problem. It will not interfere with the radiation. Number one. Number two, uh, if I have the pre-op scans available, it will let me know what is the extent of the bony involvement in the acetabulum or down below in the ischium or in the pubis. So not only the tumor bed area, it's an extensive destruction. So not only the tumor bed area where it is destroyed, in addition to that, the bony involvement will help me to control it. If there has been a single bony involvement, I may go ahead with a little bit of a higher dose. But I understand this patient already has a lesion there in the uh, upper limb. So I may restrict myself to somewhere around 30 to 40 gray. That will be the maximum dose we try to give, not more than that. And it does have a long lasting control. Uh, uh, how soon after surgery would you start the radiation? Once you feel the surgeon feels that scar is uh, maybe in a week, week to 10 days, time is not a problem. Okay. Now, for some reason, suppose this patient is unfit for any surgery or is a very high risk for surgery. Mm. What is the role of palliative radiation? Mm. And yes. Anirudh, again, the question for you is that can you do anything in terms of a, a min minimally invasive procedure which can help this patient? Um. A minimally invasive, we have two options. One is uh, do a ablation, either radiofrequency or cryo, but that is primarily and only for pain management. Uh, if we have a major fracture with displacement, there would practically be no role of any interventional radiological procedures except for pain management. Um, 
we could also do try and do uh, what we call a cementoplasty wherein we do an ablation create some space and inject bone cement to consolidate uh, a small defect in the bone but this is of uh, limited application particularly in this uh, uh, neck femur area that that would work in uh, collapse vertebrae and in the acetabulum but here it would be uh, really not a great choice how, how much radiation would be required dr kanan dr laskar here post op how many sittings of radiation because this is a question which both the chemotherapists and the surgeons will ask you because uh they want to start the systemic treatment as well and can you combine the targeted therapy treatment or the chemotherapy along with the radiation post op manish generally here we are looking at uh, whatever fractionation we use we are looking at a equivalent dose of somewhere around 50 to 60 gray now it's your uh, it will be a decision of the radiation oncologist to decide uh, what fractionation one wants to use and typically in this kind of a situation where you're looking at a palliative uh, scenario you would not want to give you uh, give the patient protracted treatment and want the patient to come to the hospital for 6 weeks so we would possibly do 20 gray in 5 fractions or 30 gray in 10 fractions uh, that would be good enough uh, for palliation so with okay, the targeted so therapy section you would want to give the full dose of radiation after a resection like this uh, it would not be justified to uh, that's the point i'm trying to make here when we are treating a patient we uh, surely need to be sure with what intent we are treating now this patient with a stage 4 lung cancer although we are looking at a you know uh, some kind of survival with the good uh, chemotherapy drugs that we have now but still uh, we would go with a shorter fractionation and not with the conventional fractionation of 6 to 7 weeks and uh, 33 in 9 uh, 33 in 11 fractions comes to almost about close to 50 gray of biologically equivalent dose so my question to the medical oncologist is that if we have good uh, targeted therapy suppose this is a egfr positive patient do i even need radiation post operative so my take will be that if we can avoid that will be better because these uh, targeted agents they have really good response rates in the tune of 70 to 80% if you have taken care of the the mechanical instability and the value added over of the additional radiation uh, can be debated honestly because this uh, target therapy will cause some healing in those areas also if it is acceptable if at all radiation maybe you know a little bit of a less radiation again making the point that uh, radiation and target therapy can be given together my worry is that if this patient is egfr negative and no mutations are positive then giving a uh, protracted radiation two things will happen a my marrow will get fired for further chemotherapies and second the delay in an aggressive malignancy like uh, lung cancer in 3 weeks they can just escalate so the value added of additional radiation in a mutation negative patient will become even more questionable so in either scenario i think uh, we should relook now uh, dr anrajan one more question for you is that suppose this was a thyroid cancer and we've resected this uh, i mean we've dealt with the fracture now what should be the plan i mean uh, would you use radio iod yeah, yeah, yeah. how do you use it yeah, yeah the thing is first we should uh, uh, when we talk of thyroid uh, that means actually initially when you did the fracture uh, when you are attacking the fracture you would have taken some tissue and done a immunohistochemistry and if it had uh, shown thyroglobulin obviously then that clinches the diagnosis even a simple thyroglobulin level of uh, if there is a bone metastasis from a thyroid cancer it's extremely high very high 800 and above so now in that such situation we are we have to first characterize the thyroid we have to see how much of remnant thyroid uh, functioning thyroid tissue is left behind and then we may have to do an iodine scan to see the differentiated metastatic component and also we may have to do an fdg pet to see the non differentiated or the undifferentiated component because uh, when you have long standing uh, metastasis in the bone from thyroid cancer uh, this entity both coexist so to answer your question yes we will need to do an iodine scan and if necessary we may have to do an fdg pet scan and we have to also see how much of uh, thyroid tissue a functioning thyroid tissue is left because we may not be in a position to give radioactive iodine to treat the uh, the skeletal metastasis unless we are going to do the thyroidectomy 
so actually if the metastasis was from thyroid the complexity is only going to increase and i have just made it very simple by just telling it in two three sentences yeah so the reason for me asking so many questions is to emphasize the point that any metastatic fracture requires a lot of multidisciplinary input before we decide what is going to be the final plan and uh, the whole prognosis changes when you've got some effective therapy we cannot assume that this patient is going to die quickly so the surgeon is responsible for putting a robust kind of a reconstruction which is going to last for the lifetime of the patient so that you don't need to operate once again and you have to look at chemotherapy radiation nuclear medicine <coughs> and interventional radiology to help you with all the other aspects of uh, managing this disease so that was the point that we make and i think we've exceeded the time that we had so if there's anybody else who wants to make a, a a comment or ask a question i think this is the time just a point on the what dr uh, muzammil was making about the marrow loss because of rt for this will be about 5 to 8 to 10 per it will not cross more than 8 to 10 percent so because they're just treating a part of the acetabulum above this and uh, medially a part of the ischium and pu pubis not much of a worry in that way okay so how much time do we have now no time for the, the organizers i think we, we will probably need to stop here ready for dinner i think the or do we have anybody from the organizers i think viraj is there right viraj is there tanisha is there yeah. you are the boss you can you can stop <laughs> it or you can let it go well it's up to you all you all guys i mean we have lots of cases and we can keep discussing we are all passionate about it we forget all <laughs> So Manish, uh, Manish, a uh, quick point about you know I I actually think uh, a couple of things that one needs to know about radiation, uh, two three things. Uh, number one, uh, the indication of radiation uh, would change a little bit based on what is the disease that you are treating. Now you could have a fracture in a myeloma, you could have a fracture in a lymphoma, uh, and other sensitive to you know U wings. then the indication of radiation would be different the last case that you showed if it was a, a myeloma probably you could get away by doing chemotherapy and radiation if it's a lymphoma you could get away by chemotherapy and radiation two three points one thing about vertebral uh, you know compressions you you patients come to us with vertebral compressions and you know what what one needs to remember is sometimes they are sent to radiation oncologists to radiate quickly because there is spinal cord compression but if that compression is because of a bone fragment that is pressing on the spinal cord that bone fragment is not going to go back with radiation so you need to remember that if it is the soft tissue that is pressing on the uh, spinal cord so because that's an emergency and you have to take a call between surgery versus radiation that's that's yes, one yes, point so that uh, i mean we, th this particular thing was focused on the limbs Yes, that's the reason why I have not included any of these spine cases. I don't think we had enough time. I think we could even finish the and, limbs. And and the other thing about limbs is, you know, the the evidence that is available. Two two things uh, people need to know. One is whether you need to give short fractionation of radiation versus long fractionation. One basic uh, rule of thumb is that long fractionated radiation prevents re re the need for re radiation and fractures. So if you're just giving radiation for pain. then short fractionation is good if you are giving radiation to prevent a fracture or to allow a fracture to heal you better give fractionated radiation 13 in 10 or maybe more than that so that's a basic rule of thumb that one needs to remember okay so i think we'll just sum it up by saying that pathological fractures require a multidisciplinary input they need to be worked up they are not surgical emergencies they require some time to work up if we have to give the right kind of treatment for these patients without ending up into problems so i think it is they can't be treated like a fresh traumatic fracture uh, even the reconstruction has to be planned properly to withstand the uh, lifetime or the expected survival of the patient and you require an input of the entire team which includes radiologists pathologists 
medical oncologists, interventional radiologists, nuclear medicine, radiotherapy, and then you have to do surgery. So it's not something which is going to be uh, done without thinking. So uh, for, for a patient to get the optimal treatment, which is going to give him a quality of life for as long as possible, I think we need to follow the rules. And that, that's the whole takeaway from this particular symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Anything you want to add? Good night. Thank you very much. For